All right, all right, all right. We are back to Black on Red, and we'll be covering chapters 10 and 11 today. And this will be some interesting stuff because we, chapter 10 is going to be talking about the purges, especially um, – it goes he basically he goes into detail about both the great purge and the second great purge so it's it's some pretty um it's pretty heavy stuff so this is going to be pretty fun to cover so let's get our screen shared um let's get this show on the road but before i do that um i'm gonna wait till um chat comes in especially jake english since jake's you know, and you know, who's a, an ongoing viewer is also Russia, a fellow Russian. So, anyways, you know, uh, this is a very fascinating history, and this is going to be very fun to cover. Of course, then again, I'm also repeating myself, which I have a bad habit of doing, but it is what it is. So, anyways, the, since I got people here now, let's start getting into this. Chapter 10, Social Engineering and the Second Purge. I had made my fateful decision at the time when disappearances were increasing, but could not yet be considered an epidemic. That soon changed the massive government scheme to reorder society, which had begun in 1933, was picking up steam. Although there was no way at the time to understand fully whether there was an overall plan and the pattern to the first purges. One later became clear. By the spring of 1936, almost all the young people trained as engineers and in the technical fields during the years 27 to 32 had disappeared. The authorities first created an entire class of technocrats and then destroyed it because they came to view this class as a threat to their power. Before they could eliminate these skilled industrial leaders, the party and the government prepared to prepared their replacements so that the country's industrial progress would not come to a grinding halt. The new group was trained in technical institutes called industrial academies or prom academias for short. Thousands of carefully selected students from the party and the com com comsomols in the 20 to 35 year old range were moved through these institutes before the first purges could begin. The prom academia provided a two-year crash engineering program. Those chosen for the program had no choice but to go. If they didn't, they fa faced severe punishment. About 75% of those recruited were little more than one generation removed from the countryside. The other 25% were born in Leningrad or Moscow of parents who were among the poorer peasants. These students were placed in groups and for the duration of their two-year course of study, they did not have to do any laboratory work or conduct tests or analysis. They were not required to experiment in their fields of study, such as chemistry, physics, or electrical or hydraulic observation. To hasten them through the curriculum, one student from each group was considered the brightest, was chosen to take the exams for his entire group. Based on this one student's performance, Everyone in the group received a certified diploma as a mechanical, chemical, or electrical engineer. Oh, my gosh. You never, ever hear this happening in Western education. It's like, okay, well, take the smartest guy, and if he graduates, the whole group graduates with him, too. That's actually just a really funny but interesting method of doing education. After graduation... These two wonders, as they were called by more experienced hands in the factory, were channeled into supervisory positions as soon as the previous job holder disappeared. This novel approach was planned obviously and carefully and carried out boldly and ruthlessly over a period of several years. From the point of view of social planning, the scheme appeared on the surface to work well. The immediate goal of creating, as the government's slogans proclaimed, an untainted, truly Soviet class of technicians was achieved. However, these new supervisors had no frontline industrial experience and due to their crash two-year study program, had a poor theoretical understanding as well. Their presence had a devastating effect on the average worker and they were the object of much silent resentment. So like this thing in, on the surface sounded like a great idea, but the people working there really didn't like it too much. 
once enough of what was the party considered to be new true socialist technicians were in place throughout the industrial sector, with thousands more enrolled in the prom academias, the large-scale purge against the current industrial leaders began. Especially vulnerable were those governments who had sent abroad to study and who took over from the old czar's class and foreign specialists. They were now considered hopelessly tainted, especially condemned by the bourgeois influence of their association with foreign specialists. The foundation upon which the technical development of the country depended to begin, I mean, the foundation upon the technical development of the country depended began to disappear rapidly. So this is something you'll never hear other communist YouTubers talk about. They'll never bring up how all, how these decisions affected the workplace because you're basically killing off or getting rid of everyone who is in charge of these work sites and replacing them with people with very little experience. Uh, non really. Okay. Why did I make that private or why did I get rid of that? Um, too much spicy language. Didn't want to break TOS and get the channel in trouble. So yeah, that one had to be, uh, put on the shelf. And I mean, most of that language came like most of that came when, you know, um, most of that came a lot later in the stream way after, um, way after I responded to the video. Uh, but yeah, like if I were to like, if I were to keep that video on here, I would have to basically edit out um, the whole entire second half of it. So, you know, back to this, like I said, you know, they took out um, professionals and replaced them with new professionals that were highly inexperienced. It became practically impossible to ignore the government orchestrated purges as they began to sweep the country. Not only was the industrial sector affected, but all other segments of society as well. By 1936, nine of the 15 members of the Politburo of the Central Committee headed by Stalin had been purged. More than half of the best brains in the country were purged from the factories to the ministries to the military. Particularly targeted were the administrative ranks, mid through upper level management, those who actually ran the country on a day-to-day -day basis, slogans appeared in the factories, and the state-controlled radio and newspapers constantly reminded everyone of the need that, to rid the Soviet system of technocrats who were being poisoned by foreign ideologies. Another factory slogan expressed the grandiose purpose behind the purge, clean out all suspicious elements, especially those who were educated during the Tsar Nicholas regardless of their sincere conversion to Bolshevism. Replace them with the pure-hearted young peasant men and women who hadn't been tainted by urban sophistication. That's pretty harsh. <laughs> tainted by urban sophistication. That's kind of funny. The purpose was to mold a new kind of human being whose only experience, only thought was of socialism, whose reason for living was to advance the socialist cause. According to how the party and the government defined it, as a result, many talented, loyal, nationalistic young people were shut out of the system. They were not allowed to attend desirable schools. They were not allowed to have responsible jobs. Their family background made them suspect and unwelcome. A toolmaker in our shop, a bright man with insatiable yearning for knowledge, was denied entrance into the Knight Engineering Institute because his father had been a Russian Orthodox priest. It made no difference to the young man was a dedicated believer in communism. Ten Russian engineers who lived in my apartment complex were removed from their jobs and exiled because the government had sent them to Germany a few years earlier for training. They were now considered hopelessly influenced by bourgeois thinking. These policies and purges of the 30s later came back to haunt the Soviet Union, especially at a time of great stress during World War II. Middle management and industry, education, and the military caved in because of a lack of experience and talent. Yeah, you're going to hear a fellow traveler or a team or any of these people talk about this shit. This is, not the, this is not the kind of Soviet history that anyone likes really discussing. But <laughs> yeah, that's so true, Jake. Persian, poisoned by urban sophistication, 
Khmer Rouge nods in agreement. Well, and that's what's funny about like, oh, that's why a lot of leftists hate tankies because they know that like if Marxism, Leninism or any variant of it took over, most of the professional managerials or just like any of these professionals that are cu com currently employed by the liberal state would all be purged out and replaced by less sophisticated. So for example, like, you know, your, your, our current like education and all these other state institutions would probably get replaced by a bunch of like, you know, more, um, less, less educated people that were, you know, um, that end up being educated by the communist apparatus. And I mean, I'm not completely against the idea of doing that, especially in America, but you know, you got to be careful who you're purging too, because some of these people, as we learned, some of the people that Stalin got rid of were pretty important people that kind of like, you know, should have, shouldn't have been killed, <laughs> gotten rid of, a, you know. The purges caused morale to plummet. The indifferences to set in, the slogans that had exhorted the workers to overtake and surpass the United States in 15 years now proclaimed, we shall destroy the enemies of the people's comrades. We were warned, always be vigilant among you are enemies of the people. People were disappearing daily. They were never tried, never convicted of any crime. They were simply sent to Ty Siberia, the Tigus, or the Arctic region, and were rarely ever heard from again. And one day in my shop of 750 people, nine people did not report for work. Three foremen were missing, four toolmakers, a technologist, and shop mechanic, Natalnik, or superintendent. The Natalnik was a Jewish mechanical engineer who had received his diploma in Germany. And he and his chief engineer and arrested. Yeah, he and his chief engineer were arrested and two months later executed. Shit, sucks to be them. From 34 to 36, more than 20 people in our shop suddenly disappeared. They were engineers, tool makers, foremen, even party members. After a while, rumors stopped circulating because everyone was afraid to talk. They were in a constant state of fear that the secret police would come knocking on the door at the middle of the night and no one could feel safe. Since I was now a Soviet citizen, I knew I was vulnerable as, as the next person. I did not think of being a member of the Moscow Soviet afforded me any protection. From being from another country became a mark of suspicion. With the rise of Hitler and Mussolini, the German and Italian workers in my factory came to the end of their road. The fascist nations were the most despised enemies of the Soviet Union. To the average Russian, Hitler was Satan and Mussolini was his chief deputy. Nearly every day, the Soviet press reported stories of atrocities committed by Nazis. Hitler's public proclamation against Bolshevism was well known in Moscow. In my factory towards the end of the 30s, a group of Austrian workers known as the Shush Bundesevs arrives, arrived. When they were named after the Schusnig, the, counselor, the Chancellor of Austria in 1938, when Germany annexed Austria to the German Reich, Schusnig protested the German move, called for a referendum on the annexation, and rallied thousands of young Austrians behind him. Schusnig was arrested and imprisoned. Although thousands of his sympathizers met a similar fate, some managed to escape and find refuge in the Soviet Union. In Russia, their name, Shush Bund Sevs, meant followers of Shushnig. These Austrians were given work and a place to live in one of the buildings reserved for foreigners. The factory administration placed them four to a room. A huge brawl erupted among them. A few weeks after they arrived, a lot of blood was spilled. Many were hurt, and most of them were wound up in the factory's first aid clinic. The administration and local NKVD investigated the incident. They discovered that a number of Nazi spies had infiltrated this group of anti-Nazis. A few days later, all of them were transferred out of the factory. No one was able to learn where they went out of the country to other factories into exile or to their graves. As a result this, of this incident, the NKVD launched a campaign to arrest all German workers regardless of their innocence or membership in the party. The wives of some of these men appealed to me for help in finding out what had happened to their husband. At the, at the time I was still a member of the Moscow Soviet, they mistakenly thought my membership meant more than it did. I was helpless and could do nothing. I could not tell them what I really thought. 
that their husbands were dead. When the woman left my apartment, I cried. Two weeks later, they vanished too. In 1936, the men who launched the 34 purge was arrested and put on trial. Yagoda, the head of the NKVD, was charged with lacking communist consciousness and vigilance and maintaining a low level of Marxist-Leninist militancy. Ironically, he was also charged with the December 1st assassination of Kirov, the Leningrad party boss. The event that served to be the catalyst of the first purges was not charged with the murder of thousands of innocent men and women who he ordered executed. His trial was held. So that's the thing. When he was executed, the, the people, the innocent people that were killed by him, he wasn't guilty of that. I mean, hell no. He was uh, <laughs> among us, Soviet edition. He was held guilty just for like, you know, an assassination and other charge, trumped up charges. His trial was held on the House of Trade Unions and made a great deal of publicity. Workers in my factory who followed the details of the trial somehow to, began to develop a sense of foreboding about the future. During the trial, I could sense that, they, that the already low morale in my factory was falling even lower. The earlier Bolshevik idealism of molding a new nation had faded. During the trial, it eroded even more. Many young idealists had been buoyed by the, trappy, by the toppling of the czarist regime in 1917 and Lenin's promise of an egalitarian society. But these hopes, which had been discouraged by the purges, were dashed during Yagoda's trial. It soon became apparent that the Russians were in four more of the same under Yagoda's successor, a small, scrawny-looking man named Yezov, who rose out of obscurity to become the new head of the NKVD, the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. Yagoda was found guilty and executed. The day after his execution, the entire factory was gloomy. I learned during my 44 years in the Soviet Union that along with their mammoth capacity for brooding, the Russian people have an uncanny ability to sense the presence of danger. This was like one of those times no one really worked. Some stood before their machines like zombies. Others pa pa paced back and forth with their shoulders hunched and their hands in their pockets. It was a far sadder scene than a Soviet funeral. Not even the usual idle chatter about food and the weather could be heard. There was only the sound of machines. So that's the thing. They sensed that something bad was going to happen. And it just like completely like destroyed morale. Because all they were doing was just standing around in a state of fear. <laughs> yeah, that would actually be quite funny. <laughs> It was not that the workers mourned the passings of the head of the secret police. He had certainly been no friend of theirs. I think instead they were girding themselves for the next onslaught of suffering that they sensed was on the horizon. Suffering was something they knew well. It was a natural part of Russian life as eating and sleeping. As for me, a day did not go by that I did not ask myself what kind of hell had I gotten myself into. No longer a U.S. citizen, I could not go home. <laughs> that's, that's just a, that's a good slogan. Suffering is 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 as Russian as eating and sleeping. <laughs> a bullet, a man not inclined to do me any favors, was still the U.S. ambassador. If by some miracle I could get home, the problems were still the same. I was branded a red, I was black, and there was a severe depression, and I needed skilled work to be satisfied. Furthermore, in Russia, I was becoming an engineer. The thought of sacrificing this dream was too painful. I just kept It just kept on going, one day at a time. I was too afraid to be depressed and too intent on my survival to think about much else. From 36 on... A day never passed without my thinking that the NKVD could drag me out of bed and send me off to some remote part of Siberia or shoot me. Most nights I could hear the foreboding sounds of NKVD cars prowling the streets or the ominous echo of a knock on the door of a nearby apartment. When would my turn come? Would it be now, I wondered? As I lay awake until dawn, in one hour or perhaps not until tomorrow, so great was my fear during these purges that I never undressed until after 4 a.m. I later learned from other workers that many of them shared my custom. Yeah, so that's how scared they were. They wouldn't even, like, take their clothes off and, and get in and get to sleep until 4 in the morning.
because that's how much of a constant state of fear they were in. During these years, before the war, one thing became quite obvious. I now knew that while America was far from perfect, the Soviet Union was no promised land either. The so-called haven for oppressed people was a constant state of incredible oppression, especially when contrasted with the idealistic vision that was presented to the outside world. I knew many idealists who came to Russia from other countries filled with good intentions and believing with all their hearts that they would be helping to create the paradise on earth depicted by Marx and Lenin. Dr. Mrs. and Mrs. Rosenblitz were such an idealist. They left behind in California the material benefits of a successful dental practice, an elegant home, two cars, and attractive clothes. Friends and relatives tried to dissuade them from leaving, but the Rosenblitzes were insistent. I met them soon after they arrived in the Soviet Union, filled with enthusiasm and ready for adventure. Dr. Rosenblitz brought this modern state-of-the-art dental equipment with him and gave it to the Soviet government as a gift. The equipment was installed in a clinic in Moscow, and he was assigned there to instruct Russian dental students in the profession. Less than a year later, Yezov's NKVD arrested the Rosenblitzes and shipped them to separate labor camps in the far north. There were temperatures of 50 degrees below zero are not uncommon. They were never returned. So see, that's the funny meme that, you know, people on the right tend to like joke about with communists. It's like, oh, you know, if you love it so much, why don't you move there? And these people, <laughs> these people did move there. And they were sent to labor camps in less than a year. <laughs> Even after contributing like, you know, to, to dentistry in the country, they were just pretty much, Yezov pretty much sent them both off to a labor camp. <laughs> So much for the Soviet dream, <laughs> man. That that's total. That's that's just like that's so bad. That's so that's so tragic. But it's so ironic because they're like these true believers that thought you know they were walking into the workers' paradise, and now they're just um, you know gulagged. The first state ball bearing plant benefited from the idealism of a group of six Russian born Americans who had returned to their native land to help build the idealist socialist state, the ideal socialist state. They were all ordinary workers before coming in 30 and 31 had pulled together their savings and purchased the modern electrical equipment that was installed in the factory's four story thousand seat dining hall. They had planned and installed the equipment themselves, then instructed the local people on how to operate it. From the time the factory opened in March 1932, most workers ate their lunch in the dining hall and were well satisfied with the meals they were served. One day in 1937, five of them failed to report to work. They had disappeared the night before. The remaining one of the group eventually committed suicide later that year. Another group of Russian Americans also met a tragic end. They had returned to Russia full of revolutionary zeal bearing equipment for modern laundry in the factory. This group also helped to install, mount, and test new equipment, and then later taught the local people how to operate the machines. They all disappeared during the purges of 36 to 38. To the best of my knowledge, none of them were ever seen again. As the purges intensified, it became clear that the rule of law simply did not exist. Any sense of justice was swept away by the midnight knock of the NKVD. In my factory, a person no longer dared seek redress of grievances. If you reported that someone had cheated you, or if you tried to correct an injustice yourself, you were likely to find yourself in a boxcar headed to, for Siberia. One toolmaker I admired was a 24-year-old man of exceptional ability hired in 1934. Bogotov was normally quiet, soft-spoken, and very bright. Although he was definitely of leadership caliber, he was not a party member. I suspect he was either indifferent or disenchanted with communism. Because normally a person with his abilities and potential would have been swept into the party if he had showed enthusiasm for the Soviet system. One spring morning of 36, Bogotov's troubles began. When he came to work and picked up his assignment from the foreman, he noticed that he was given a job that he had done two months earlier. It should be understood that most categories of people in the Soviet Union were working under the piecework system, 
street sweepers, bus drivers, salespeople, harvesters, barbers, tailors, people milking cows, factory workers. Everyone got a technological card listing his work category from one to eight and also indicating the time required to do the task and the amount of money the task was worth. Bogotov approached the shop's norm setter who assigned the time needed to complete the job and how much it was worth. He thought a mistake had been made in his assignment. The norm setter was adamant. He said there had been no mistake and that there was no record of the job having been done before. And then in a loud voice, he accused Bogotov of making a false charge and ordered him to leave immediately. Bogotov looked at the norm setter and said quietly, it is people like you who make life so difficult for us. Preach it, brother. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, preach it, brother. It's it, and it's true. These stupid, stupid, freaking dumbasses. Like, he's right. That it's like it's people like them that make life so difficult for them. But you know that person didn't care. The next day, Bogatov came to work, still looking unhappy about the incident. The night the NKVD knocked on his door and whisked him away to a Siberian labor labor camp. Although his sister, as an assistant secretary of the factory's committee, had some influence, she did not try to intercede on his behalf, fearing that if she did, they would implicate her and make things even worse for her brother. One night during the summer of 1936, someone knocked on the door of my apartment. It was 11 o'clock and the purges were gaining momentum. After 10 p.m., people did not open their doors on the first knock. Sometime after the purges had slackened, one couple told me that whenever there was more than a series of two knocks on their apartment door after 11.30 p.m., they would hug and kiss each other and then hug and kiss two of their children before opening the door. Twice in 1937, the NKVD had come for someone else in their apartment. The person continued knocking and then loudly called out my name to assure me that he was an acquaintance and not the NKVD. When I opened the door, I saw VM, the man who... I had met in Stalingrad in the summer of 30. He was wearing the same pilot suit and the cap that he had then. I felt the same weariness I had felt then and was on my guard immediately. As I greeted him, I wondered how he found me. He came in without invitation, but I kept him standing just inside the door. He quickly said, Comrade Robinson, I have come to ask you to do me a great favor. I hope you will help me. What is it? I asked. Please don't refuse me, he continued. You see, I am greatly in need of two small ball bearings for my bicycle. I have 10 miles from Moscow, and I always have to use my bicycle instead of having to walk two and a half miles to catch the train. Please help me. I shall always be grateful to you. I am working on the machine at the tool shop, I told him. I have nothing to do directly with the output of bearings. VM persisted. He continued to try to angle he could think of, but he knew that the, what the game was about. He was trying to trap me. If I were to help him by bringing the ball bearings to him, I would be charged with sabotage or with theft of state goods, then exiled or shot. After 20 minutes of fending off his arguments, I told him we are disturbing the neighbors and said, listen, it's useless to try to convince me. I cannot do what you want me to do. Go tomorrow to the administration of the factory and put your case before them. I'm sure they will help you. Good night. That was the last I saw of him until almost a year later when he came back again. Although Yezov was still round, rounding up so-called enemies of the people, when I heard a knock on my door a little before midnight, I remembered VM and opened the door without hesitation. There he stood again in the same clothing, wearing a wry smile on his face. I said in an abrupt business-like manner, what can I do for you? I feel very awkward, he replied. I have to seek help again for my bicycle. Well, did you go see the factory administration as I recommended? I asked. Yes, he said. I was successful in getting two bearings, which were not new, but good enough to serve until a week ago. But now almost all the balls have fallen out. So I've come to ask you to get me about a dozen balls. Concealing my disgust, I told him, please do not come to me from any assistance about ball bearings again. You are simply wasting your time. Please understand that. I shook his hand and bade him good night. Then I cautiously nudged him out. And that was the last I ever saw of him. I expect that whoever sent him was convinced by then of the useless, use, uselessness of trying to entrap me in this manner. You never knew when the MKVD would strike. 
I was not always in the middle of the night. I, I mean, it, sorry. It was not always in the middle of the night when the NKVD could strike. Informers were in practically every housing development, including ours, but it was difficult to tell who they were. It could be a kindly appearing old lady. It could be your best friend. Wise people kept all conversation on a superficial level. The terror was such that no one dared to speak, even to relatives on the street, without looking over his shoulder first, and then only in a whisper. Only once did the police knock on my door. It was 1943 at about 12.30 a.m. When I opened, they saw my dark-skinned, non-Russian face and excused themselves. I obviously was not the person they were looking for. In mid-January 1937, a friend of mine did not show up for a meeting we had arranged. I had first met Kokiel in the 1932 when he introduced himself to me as a member of the shop's trade union committee. He had helped me two years later when I was recovering from my bout of pleurisy. When Kokiel learned that I had been assigned to a home of rest for people stricken with sexual diseases, he got my pass changed to Miss Moore, a far more desirable and appropriate vacation spot. Then on the day I was about to leave, he came to my apartment and carried my suitcases all the way to the train station. Although I've always had to be wary of him because that was how one tried to survive in the Soviet Union, I also liked him. After he failed to show up, I waited a couple days and then went on, went to his department and asked his comrades where he was. At first, no one answered my question. When I asked again in a louder voice, one of his colleagues looked up at me as eyes filled with tears and, and said, I am sorry to tell you, Comrade Robinson, but we don't know. He hasn't come to work for almost a week now. Without saying a word, I went back to my workplace feeling very disturbed. After work, I went directly to his apartment. A woman tenant answered my knock. Please excuse me, I said. Are the Kokiels in? She said no, and then I moved too close to the door. I held on to the door and explained that we worked together and that I had not seen him for a little over a week. I am a foreigner, I said, but you need not to be afraid of me. If he is not home, may I speak to his wife? At the word wife, the woman raised her hand and looked at me and said, she is not here either. Four days ago, a truck came here at night with two policemen and told her that she must vacate the room immediately. They began moving out all their furniture, all their belongings at once. They ordered her to go with them, and that was the last time we saw her. We did not know what was to become of either of them. She then invited me into the apartment and showed me the Coquille's room was sealed. I could do nothing else except thank her and leave. As I was on my way out, she said, I beg of you, please do not tell anyone what I told you and showed you. I promised. The reign of terror under Yezov from the end of 1936 to the beginning of 1939 was far broader and more ruthless than the earlier one under Yagoda. It was a time of inhumanity at its worst. The brooding Russians have been right to fear the passing of Yagoda. So that's the thing. As much as people say that Yagoda was scary and that he killed a lot of people, Yezov was even worse. Um, contrary to what someone like Grover Fur would tell you. But they, that's why I say Grover Fur is not a credible source. But yeah, this was terrible stuff. And this made life miserable for people. So then we go to chapter 11. I am interrogated. On the spring morning of 1937, I was summoned to the designing department. This was the NKVD's lair in our factory, the place where workers were summoned and sometimes never returned. As I left, I was sure the apprentices working with me believed that they were seeing the last of Robert Robinson. The thought that this was the end certainly passed through my mind. Not scared. My own reaction bothered me because I knew I ought to be frightened. As I approached the designing department, I saw three men seated at a table facing the entrance. None of them acknowledged my greeting. I was motioned to sit in the chair directly in front of them. Comrade Robinson began one of them. How did you happen to come to the Soviet Union? I came to the Soviet Union through a one-year contract, I said, trying to emulate his tone and approach. By whom were you invited? The Soviet Union invited me through its representatives, Comrade Ivanov who was recruiting technicians at the Ford Motor Company in Detroit in the United States of America. Can, be, can you remember what date you were unemployed? The third week of April, 1930. When did you leave the United States for the Soviet Union? May 30, 1930. When did you arrive at the Soviet Union? I hesitated for a moment. 
I wanted to give them accurate answers. I guess that they already knew all the answers and were checking to see if I was indeed the real Robert Robinson. Having already lived in Russia for seven years, I had grown accustomed to the Russian way of thinking. I understood that my interrogators most likely considered it possible that the real Robert Robinson was killed by a black American intelligence agent who took over his identity in order to spy for the U.S. government. I answered the question correctly. Then, at, then another asked, Comrade Robinson, do you have your old contract? Yes, but it is in my apartment, I said. After lunch, bring it to us. Yes, of course. I thought to myself how tricky they were. I, if I have no evidence that I'm really Robert Robinson, I was good as dead. Still, I was sure I could get my hands on the contract. Thank God, I thought. I'm a fastidious person who keeps everything important in neat files. The next question is, what organization invited you to work in this factory and when? I was invited by Vato in July 1932. Were you under contract also? Yes, a one-year contract, which was renewed every year. Please also bring your contract with the factory after lunch. Yes, I will. That's all for now, Comrade Robinson. I returned to my desk, unable to concentrate on the mathematical problem before me. Waiting anxiously for the lunch bell to ring, I knew that I had the contracts, but it had been a long time since I had gone through my files. Suddenly, a horrible thought paralyzed me. What if the NKVD agent entered my apartment while I was at work and took the contracts? I tried to calm myself down by reasoning, I'm not their enemy. What would they want with me? I'm no threat to the Soviet system. As soon as the bell rang, I wanted to dash to my apartment. I realized I, I realized that I was being watched and that I most likely would be followed. So I knew I had to act naturally. Running would be taken as a sign of guilt. And under the Soviet system, if they catch you appearing guilty, you're as good as in prison for six feet under. Uh, uh, shit. I, I hate how I do this with words. It's so frustrating. Sorry about that. You are as good as in prison or six feet under the ground. I entered my apartment. Uh, and it's just the way the author words this. You're as good in prison or six feet under the ground. And that just kind of rolls off the tongue wrong sometimes when you read that like really quickly. I entered my apartment and I began looking through my files to my relief. Both contracts were there. I then waited in my room for a while, thinking that if I rushed back, I would give the NKVD the impression that I was anxious or nervous. I wanted them to feel that I knew I had nothing to hide or fear. When I gave them the contracts, I asked politely if they could return them to me. They assured me that I would get them back in a few days. I never did. After five attempts, I stopped asking for them, lest I antagonize them. But not having the contract stuck me as a serious blow to my plan to leave the Soviet Union one day. They served as the only evidence that I had gone to Russia as a foreign specialist on contract and not as a communist ideologue in search of a new nation. As the American press had accused me, now that evidence was gone and the only thing left was my word. And I knew that that would not be worth much back home. I expect that the contracts were seized as a calculated means of making me more dependent on the Soviet Union and attempt to cut my ties further and set up additional barriers to my returning to the United States. They certainly did not want to have a disenchanted Robert Robinson who would have publicly, I mean, who would have publicized internationally as a black American pilgrim to the promised land of the Soviet Union returning to America and blowing the whistle on their communist paradise. That would be no good for the Kremlin's image as a refugee for the oppressed people of the world. And see, that's the thing. If he had returned to the United States at the time this um, this would have happened, he would have like blown the whistle on just all the bullshit propaganda that the Soviet Union was telling other people internationally. I knew that they had reason to be concerned about me. No matter how long I lived in the Soviet Union, I never knew I could never call it home. There was no, there was not only the treachery of the political system, but also the official denial of the spiritual nature of man. As much more than anything else, that denial created a deadly atmosphere that made life a daily test. All I could do was pray for strength to survive in such an amoral world. And yeah, you're right, Santos. This book would have made an amazing movie. But you know, um, that will never happen, sadly. Um, 
I could never condone such savage disregard for the value of human life. I could never feel proud to be a Soviet citizen. In a sense, I now regretted that taking that rash step, but at the time I had no other realistic choice. Now I wanted to leave, but I was a Soviet citizen and they could do with me whatever they pleased. If I tried to leave through the official channels, I would be branded a traitor and sent into exile. Getting help from the United States was out of the question, at least as soon as I had something to concentrate on that would leave me with even less time to think about my predicament. On July 1937, I began my engineering education. No more working two shifts. I would now attend classes at night. It had taken me several months to obtain a recommendation from my shop and a letter of request from the party's factory secretary approving of my plan to study for a degree. He wrote to the principal of the Moscow Evening Technical Institute, this is to certify that the Negro Robert Robinson is a helpful member of our collective, and we ask you to assist him in any way possible to enlist him as one of your students. Secretary of Party Committee of the First State Ball Bearing Plant, Moscow. I took my exams, passing physics with an A and chemistry with a C. The next exam was in math, there are two stages in the Soviet examination system, written and oral, with the written exam coming first. After I had completed the math problems given to me, an examiner looked over them and said, the third problem is not correct. Will you sit down, please? He quickly wrote down a simple problem for me to solve. I did so, then he gave me another one, which I solved. When a third one, each problem was tougher than the one before. When I was unable to solve correctly, the fifth problem he gave me. He told me to go home and study the material again because I was weak in mathematics. During the following week, I studied the entire mathematical program and then returned. The same examiner saw me this time and told me to wait for him. I felt discouraged because usually you can choose any examiner at all because he, rather than the examiner choosing you. As soon as I sat down before him, he began to test me with the problem one after another in a drill-like fashion. I was soon not only nervous but confused as well. I solved five problems, and then he told me that I was, and then I told him that I was mentally exhausted. And then he told me, "You've made good progress," smiling at me. But you'll have to come back again next week. When I returned the following week, I was determined to avoid him. But to, to my surprise, soon after I arrived, a student came out of the examining room and asked, "Is, Ro is Robinson present?" When I answered him, he said, "Examiner." Ivan Petrovsky wants you to come to him. No sooner than I had gone in and sat down before him than my mind totally went blank. Sensing my confusion, he gave me only three simple problems to solve as a starter. Then he moved to more complex problems. He kept me much longer than usual, 20 minutes, and then said, you've done very much better. Give me your exam record book. Inside the book, he marked C. He marked a C at this point. I finally asked him, why had you examined me so much longer and more thoroughly than the other students? He said, I've never had the chance to examine anyone from the USA. I was interested in comparing the knowledge of its high school students, especially a black one, to that of ours. I did not mean any harm. I was simply curious. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's somewhat racist. I passed my entrance exams, and on September 1st, 1937, I attended the first session of series of lectures in a large auditorium with more than 200 other students. My examiner, Ivan Petrovsky, who was, who was, as it turned out, was also the dean of mathematics, provided the instruction. All lectures were, of course, delivered in Russian. Because I could not yet write quickly enough in Russian, I would translate the lectures in my head and write my notes in English. At the examination's time, I studied my English language lecture notes and then answered the questions in Russian. I frequently clashed with my teachers because I neither misunderstood or mistranslated the original lectures. Even with the intensity of my counters of my coursework, it was still difficult to avoid thinking about the possibility of being arrested. One evening in midsummer 1938, I was in downtown Moscow on my way to class when I noticed the large gathering of people standing before a large banner attached to the military academy building. As I drew closer to the crowd, I was struck to, by their silence. The banner proclaimed, these enemies of the people, General Goryev, General Grishin, and General Uritsky, were found guilty of treason and dealt with accordingly. 
The crowd of people just stood there horrified. Three generals revered as national heroes the day before, now killed as enemies of the state. It underscored the awareness that no one was safe. That night in my class, I could not concentrate. I began to question seriously whether it was worth pursuing an engineering degree in such a terror-filled society. Unfortunately, I had no choice. Where could I go? Like my classmates, I was a Soviet citizen. I had to be very, very careful. That This was during the height of Yezov's campaign. He was, he was unpredictable. No one was safe. Two of Lenin's closest allies, Zinoviev and Kamenev, had been liquidated. Likewise, 10 leading Red Army generals, Emelkel Koltsov, perhaps the most admired journalist in Russia, who was reputed to have enjoyed a close relationship with Stalin, fame, and reputation, obviously made no difference. In 1938, when people said goodbye to one another after work, it was a very firm handshake and a penetrating look into each other's eyes. We were saying this will perhaps be the last time we shall ever see each other. If so, farewell. Damn, that's sad. So they were like shaking their hands firm because it's like, you know what? I might not see you again. No one knew whose turn was next. Almost all the really experienced and truly talented people were liquidated. A number of times in confidential discussions with one of the lucky Russians who survived the purges, I was told that Russia would never again have such an army of people devoted to the cause of socialism. By 1938, with the formation of the new Soviet elite, a process which has continued to the presence, a new breed of rulers appeared, less well-trained, and less devoted than those they replaced. And yeah, that like um, that chain of succession is what led to the, because this, this book was written like a couple years before the Soviet Union dissolved, but that um, chain of succession pretty much is like, you know, the bureaucrats that dissolved the Soviet Union later on with Gorbachev and that shit. Because you just basically get these, you you, you go from people who had expertise and devotion to the cause to just people that don't really to, – to just these stupid opportunists that don't really give a damn other than their own, like, you know, personal goals. So, yeah, like what Stalin did in hindsight was actually kind of stupid, especially when you consider that Khrushchev came in afterwards. So, yeah, it, his purges were pretty fucking dumb. Um, Yezov's purge was far more insane than the one under Yagoda. In all its tragedy, tragedy, the purge that Stalin had Yagoda carry out had a certain rationale. If you disregarded the value of human life over animal life and believed that the state was more important than the people comprising it, then the state organized terror, exile, and murder could seem reasonable and even desirable. A new privileged class was created dependent on the government and party for its favors. For the best apartments, food and clothing, use of the resource centers, low-cost automobiles, and so forth, many years later, I learned that at a meeting in the 30s of the Executive Committee of the Central Committee of the Politburo, Stalin said he was not created. Oh, uh, uh, shit. Urgh! Okay, I'll reread that. Sorry. Stalin said, had we not created a new social rank, we could have failed to accomplish our program. Well, joke was on him later on. Um, the purges were hell in any case, but under Yezov, they became wild, unpredictable, frenzied scientists, artists, politicians, engineers, teachers, physicians, factory workers, army officers, street sweepers. No one was exempt. Everyone was a potential target. Only after Stalin's death did the government admit that mistakes were made. Six million people who were executed were exonerated post, post, posthumously. When the government cleaned their slates and enabled their spouses or children to receive some monetary compensation, an official certificate stating that the victim had been innocent. The Soviet government still denounces periodically the purges under Stalin. On November 1st, 1987, at a party meeting celebrating the 70th, 70th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, Soviet leader Gorbachev issued a statement denouncing the crimes of Stalin as erroneous and unforgivable. In a lengthy speech, he said a new commission would renew the inquiry into the purges and that he would accelerate the ongoing efforts to clear the records. 
of those who had been falsely arrested, exiled, or shot. Well, he also accelerated the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but that's, that's you know, not really covered in his book. Of course, just because the government confessed to mistakes after Stalin's death did, it, did not mean that the Soviet citizens were no longer terrorized. These practices continued until the day I fled. Only their temples slowed down while the methods for gathering intelligence and controlling and eliminated undesirable people grew more sophisticated. Yeah, so, I mean, even after the death of Stalin, it's not like you had pure freedom. You still were being watched at all times. Everybody would spy on you. You could still disappear and get thrown out somewhere like a mental institution. The Yezob purges continued into early 1939. On the final day of December of 38, I was unable to attend a New Year's Eve party given by the Wissers, an American couple, because I was at home with the flu. The Wissers, who taught at the Foreign Language Institute, were allowed to celebrate the New Year like anyone else in Russia. However, it was unacceptable and dangerous to recognize Christmas which was eliminated as an official holiday after the revolution. The party position was that no mo modern thinking person could accept the idea of God. And that makes me laugh because you see these like corny Christian movies, like with Kirk Cameron, you know, saving Christmas or the war on Christmas. And the Soviet Union pretty much does, um, took care of that by abolishing Christmas. So <laughs> no more Santa Claus in the Soviet Union. So yeah, the party position in justifying with that was that no modern thinking person could ever accept the idea of a god. Because if you accepted the idea of a god, you are just a primitive savage in their minds. Those who wished to celebrate Christmas had to do so quietly and only with trusted friends. As it turned out, I was fortunate to be sick on this December 31st. My illness spared me the ordeal of a visit by the NKVD. I learned later that just a moment or two before midnight, the host was filling people's glasses with vodka. A loud pounding was heard at the front door. The host opened the door to four large men wearing heavy overcoats. They showed their NKVD badges and then were led to the parlor where a large pool table stood. I mean, not pool table, but a large table stood, heaped with exotic foods like caviar, suckling pig, goose, pickled vegetables, cakes and pastries, wines and vodka. The agents wasted little time. They asked to see everyone's passport, which fortunately no one had forgotten. The books were checked thoroughly, even shaken, and then tossed to the floor. The party goers were ordered to stand in a line with their hands to their side. One of the agents watched them while the other three began to ransack the apartment. They stripped the bed, flinging the linens, covers, and pillowcases on the floor, and then looked under the mattresses. Every cupboard was examined. They opened the wardrobe and checked every out every suit, every pair of pants, and all of the shoes, dresses, and coats. The agents explored the apartment for more than four hours while the guests stood practically at attention, some crying. Yeah, this sounds like a dystopian hell, hellscape. I don't know how anyone would want to say that like living here was a great thing at the time. I mean, that just sounds like fucking scary. The NKVD found nothing worth taking with them. Around 4 a.m., they left without saying a word. Everyone was in a state of shock. At this point, no one was in the mood to continue the party. After helping the host put the apartment back in the order, the guests left quietly. This event was an ill omen for 1939. Things eventually did get better, but first they got worse. Moscow, Linda, L Moscow lived under a blanket of gloom. I did not believe I ever saw anyone with a bright face or smile. Sadness was everywhere, in the streets, in the restaurants, in my shop, and in the factory at large. People were living under a state of siege, but soon they were to hear some startling news. I was in the factory when Stalin's arrest of Yezov was announced over the radio. We all stopped and stared speechlessly at one another. It was difficult to believe that Yezov had lost power. Clearly, there was a sense of relief but it was mingled with apprehension about what would come next. There was a renewed sense of faith in Stalin for prevailing over Yezov. After Yezov was arrested, he acted if he were insane and was shipped off to a mental institution. The rumors all over Moscow was that he was being foxy and using his ploy to escape execution, but he did not succeed. A party member whose information was reliable told me that Yezov held out first, but eventually a confession was forced out of him. 
He revealed that he had been planning to seize power from Stalin by purging members of the Politburo. Yezov, the murderer of millions, was taken before a firing squad and shot. Yeah, and, and I don't feel sorry. Good riddance to that piece of shit. They should have killed him sooner. So part two is going to be about the war years and their aftermath, where we get to chapter 12, which is the Hitler-Stalin pact, and that one is going to be very fun to cover when we get to it. That's going to break a lot of popular narratives, and a lot of people that uh, love propaganda are not going to be too happy about that one. So yeah, that's it for to, that's it for um, the last two chapters. So I'll send the link if anyone wants to come on and discuss um, chapter ten and eleven in this book, because this was some interesting stuff today, for sure. But yeah, no, like. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? But yeah, it was terrible. I mean, people were just living in a constant state of fear, especially under Ye Yezov. I mean, it was bad under Yagoda, but Yezov made it far worse. But then when Yezov got executed, I mean, that was just pretty much a wonderful thing. Uh, couldn't have happened to a better person. Um, and it should have happened sooner, in, in all honesty. So yeah, I'm just gonna wait until people hop on, and then we can, uh, you know, have a little uh, have a little discussion here and there about it. Uh, it's always fun to talk to Jake about this stuff, you know, since Jake's a Russian. Okay, so so let me check if like the audio is like properly working because. Sometimes that happens, and that's really annoying. But it seems like it is. Yeah, exactly. This Hitler-Stalin pact is what I've been waiting for. Yeah, it pissed off a lot of people in the Soviet... It pissed off a lot of Russians when that pact was signed. They felt like Stalin pretty much sold them out to the Germans. It was also upsetting to them because they were like... Um, make it, they were like... I, I, I can't, I'll just basically get to cover, get to it when I cover it because I don't want to spoil too much of it actually. But I think you I think you all kind of get the point that it was kind of a stab in the back to the Russian people who for years were anti-Nazi, anti-fascist, and then here their leader is making a pact with the enemy. And of course, there's a lot of people who like to cope about it. And they like to excuse it and come up with all kinds. They like to pull all kinds of shit out of their ass. But, you know, fact is fact. Reality is reality. Oh, no. Like, I know my audio sounds good. I'm just saying that, like, sometimes I have to adjust the settings on here because I can't hear when somebody pops in or when, or when somebody comes on. Because sometimes when the microphone's connected in, I have to change all the sound settings so I can hear all external sound. It's really stupid, honestly. Speaking of that, I've got to um, see. I gotta like, I gotta like, um, go take a quick uh, break. I'll, I'll be right back. I'll just play this in the background really quick.
All right. Yeah. So if Jake doesn't pop on, I'll probably end the stream because it's always interesting to hear what he has to say. Um, Santos, if you want to pop on, you're always welcome to. It's always interesting to hear what you have to say as well. But yeah, I mean, I love reading this book because it just really just shows like how hollow and how dishonest a lot of propaganda can be. I mean, but then again, I really just kind of hate all forms of propaganda because I understand like the why it's used because it's used to put a positive light on the government or the state or just like anything that's being like, you know, advertised or sold. But to me, I just I hate all of it equally. It's all just basically, you know, put up by a bunch of smoke and mirrors. That's what I really think of propaganda, to be honest with all of you. I, I just don't like any of it. I mean, it serves its purpose, but yeah, it's just not really something I really support or care for at times. But it can be useful. Like, I'm not denying that. But yeah, if, if Jake doesn't pop on, yeah, this will probably, good. This will probably just uh, be wrapped up fair pretty soon. But yeah, it's just uh, it's just interesting to read all this stuff. Yeah, it, that's true. It can be used for both good and evil. I do see a lot more people using it for evil than good. But yeah, it can be for good things too. I mean, like it's it's good. Like if you're trying to use it against evil, that's for sure. But again, it is a tool, and like any tool, it can be used for either ends. And that's what I've learned, you know, with a lot of things in life is everything is just pretty much a tool that could be used to serve either ends. But anyways, uh, he's not popping on. And uh, I don't know, like, I don't see anyone hopping on. So I think I'll probably just wrap this up and we'll uh, get to the Hitler Stalin pact in the next episode. So anyways, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, catch you next time.